Good afternoon. Welcome to the ninth annual Jacobs Institute College College uh, Internship Program final presentation. Thank you for coming. I'm Pam Marcucci. I'm the Vice President for Programs at the JI. Um, before turning the floor over to Emily Harley, our Education Assistant, who's the mastermind behind the internship programs this summer, I'd like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the Jacobs Institute for those of you who don't who aren't familiar with us. So the JI is a nonprofit medical device innovation center, and our mission is to accelerate the development of new tools and technologies to better treat and diagnose vascular disease. Heart attack and stroke rates are higher in Buffalo than they are in Western New York than they are in the rest of the state or country, so obviously this is a big task. Um, the JI pursues its mission through educational programming targeted at different audiences. So we target industry, students, the community. We also pursue our mission through regulatory and engineering activities. We help our clients make better medical devices. Um, and then finally, we pursue our mission through the Idea to Reality Center, which is a medical device a proof of concept center where we can vet new technologies and um, help develop them if they are fe um, feasible. So our unique location above a vascular hospital, so the four floors below us are Clyde Health Gates Vascular Institute. So we're above a vascular hospital and we're below a university clinical and translational research center, UB CTRC. So this unique location allows us to do all the steps in the medical device development process right here in this building through early feasibility in human. So we've been fortunate enough in the past 10 years to have had more than 40 college interns who have helped further our mission. The first year we had interns, I think they outnumbered us. Um, so they've been a, an integral part of everything we do. And they've gone on to do great things. Some of them are in large medical device companies such as Medtronic, Johnson & Johnson. Some are working for technology companies such as Apple. Some are pursuing medical degrees, dentistry degrees, PhDs in neuroscience, and some of them, fortunately for us, are working for the Jacobs Institute. Um, as the last thing that I just wanted to mention today before passing the floor over to um, Emily is that all of our proof of concept activities in the Idea to Reality Center as well as our educational activities are funded with our fee-for-service activities as well as philanthropy. So if anyone's interested in learning about philanthropic opportunities, we've got Katie Simon here who's our philanthropy coordinator. Um, she'd be happy to, to set up a meeting with you or talk to you after the, the presentations at the reception across the hall. Additionally, any of our staff would be interested to, to tell you more about the activities that I mentioned before. So please feel free to come up to us after and um, we can tell you a little bit more about what we do. So now with no further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Emily. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Emily. Um, I coordinate the education programs here at the JI. Um, and I know you all didn't come here today to hear me talk, but I just have a few things that I want to say before we get started. Um, as an athlete, I have first hand accounts knowing that the success of this summer was a complete team effort and I'd like to start by saying some thank you. So first off to our founder, Dr. Hopkins, who's made it out here this afternoon and Dr. Siddiqui for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for Pam, all of her guidance and support. Um, in my position this year, it's been amazing. Um, I'd also like to thank our intern mentors and guest speakers for your expertise this summer. And thank you to our generous donors for their support to make both our college and high school internships this summer a success. I've joked to some of you that being in charge of seven interns suddenly in June uh, gave me a glimpse into the chaos of parenthood. Um, <laughs> even though these young professionals are more like little brothers and sisters to me in age. Um, I've been constantly impressed by their insights and skills, and although sometimes they came to me with questions that I couldn't answer, uh, I learned and grew along with them. So speaking of learning, 
My very first time at the JI was actually a year ago as a guest at this presentation. Um, and similar to what you can expect today, you'll hear about 3D printing, engineering, and neurovascular research. Ultimately, I went home that day completely confused, but intrigued. <laughs> Um, what it took more time to learn and what will help frame today's presentation is that the JI is the intersection of medical care and medical research. And our three pillars, in my own words, are collaboration, innovation, and education. It's a full circle moment for me today to be able to organize this event and actually understand what we're all about this time. So just two logistical reminders before we get started. Please hold on to your questions until the end. Um, we have a handheld mic that I can walk to you if you raise your hand, just so we have great audio for posterity and for YouTube. Um, and after the Q&A, I invite you all to come across the hall to a reception in the JI. We have a live flow model demo set up in the training lab. We have some of our high school intern posters um, in the lobby, and we have snacks and drinks. So if you don't come for the information, come for the food. <laughs> Um, all right, interns, take a deep breath. Remember that I'm super proud of all of you and take it away. Hello, my name is Sarah Wack and I was one of the education interns with the Jacobs Institute this summer. So you just heard a brief introduction from both Pamela Marcucci and Emily Harley about the Jacobs Institute. We work with physicians, entrepreneurs, engineers to create medical devices and get them out to the patients who desperately need them, especially with the Western New York community stroke rates being so high. Now, that sounds really fancy, right? You're just gonna have a casual conversation with a neurosurgeon. That blew my mind when I first came here. But that's exactly how this works. And a lot of this involves you know, meeting with different companies, training the physicians, a lot of discussion, a lot of collaboration. So at the core of all this fanciness is education. But education begins when you're young, right? You go to kindergarten, you go all the way through. And the Jacobs Institute recognizes that, so we offer many different educational opportunities for our younger audiences. So this will include internships, including the one that I just partook in this summer. This also includes an internship with our high schoolers. You'll hear a little more about that one later. This includes brain boot camps, which allows us to work with even younger audiences, going down into middle school. This also includes webinars, which also allows us to be very accessible to not only just the Buffalo community, but beyond, because we're able to record them and then post them to our YouTube page for later on. And there's many more to come. But there's something I want to touch on also with this. So how does this align with curriculum? That's kind of a hot topic word, right? And well, New York State curriculum is actually fairly open-ended. Uh, it wants to emphasize engineering, but that's not always possible. Well, lucky for us, we're in a building full of engineers. Now there's another one too, that Common Core Learning Standards. I feel like we've all heard of that one before. And there's an emphasis on literacy and writing with that. Now you're thinking, well, you just read, and you're, you read your Shakespeare in your English class and then you just move on, right? But you know, being able to read, being able to write, that is so, so important, no matter what career you end up in. And that's especially important for the sciences. And so what's beautiful with some of the educational opportunities we have here, we're able to supplement what's happening in the classroom or may have not even happened in the classroom yet. We see this especially with our high school interns who are able to conduct many research projects. So this involves them you know, looking up scientific papers, doing the in-text citations and so forth. So we're really able to make sure that they're really prepared for whatever they decide to choose. So, if you ever take any sort of education course in college for any reason, you, the first thing your professor is going to say to you is, be flexible, number one rule of teaching. Your lesson plan isn't actually going to happen the way you want it to happen. Your week is going to fall apart. That's just how life works. And this is true no matter what career you're in. And this is something that my colleagues and I definitely discovered this summer as we worked through different you know, snags and everything in our projects. You be flexible, you just kind of roll with it and continue on forward. So we have a bit of a story for you today. We decided to take a page out of Dr. Snyder's book and we're gonna tell you a story about what we did this summer. And that story has to do with that GoFars 3000. We'll get to that in a little bit. 
But before we begin this story, there's a couple terms you want to be familiar with that will make everything make a lot more sense. Now, I have a background in the humanities, so some of these terms were a bit unfamiliar to me, but I've since learned them over the summer, and you'll be learning them right now with me. So the first thing is stroke. The Jacobs Institute is huge on stroke, right? So stroke is a problem with the blood supply to the brain. There's two types of strokes I want you to be familiar with, and two in general. So the ischemic stroke, which is blockage due to a blood clot, this is the one you've probably heard about the most. Then there's a hemorrhagic stroke, which is bleeding from a ruptured vessel. Then I want you to be familiar with the word catheter, which is a thin tube used to reach a blood clot. Revascularization, which is restoring blood flow via angioplasty or surgical means. Aspiration, the act of withdrawing blood blockage via suction. And then one particular catheter, aspiration catheter, which is that thin tube used to clear blockage in a vessel. And just because I like to build suspense, I'm going to give you one more term, benchtop testing. So this is when we use models for pre-surgical planning, device testing, and training. These models are hooked up to a flow pump to simulate the real human experience. Now, in this photo, you'll notice a lot of things are happening, right? We have a flow pump, we have tubing, we have a model. Everything's happening in this photo. And the reason why I wanted to include this photo is it because it reflects everything that some of our engineers interns did this summer, and you're going to learn more about it. So what exactly is this GOFARS 3000 we've been kind of talking about a little bit? So well, first, it's an acronym, right? So the first letters reflect the first letters of our names. And it stands for the Flexible Aspiration Retrieval System. This is fake. This is not real. Please don't Google this. You'll find nothing about it. It is a fake medical device that we're going to use to tell you a story about what we did this summer. So essentially, when a company comes to the Jacobs Institute, they come with a medical device. They want to change the patient experience, help the patients. But the device probably isn't ready yet, and it's going to have to go through several different steps before it's ready to help the patient population. That's what the Jacobs Institute does. And that's how all our projects this summer connect. They might not make sense to connect. We have engineers, we have pre-med, we have education. But this, through our story, you're going to see exactly how they connect through this medical device that we're creating, completely fake, to try to explain this. So this is the story of how to go far. Please welcome our first engineering intern, Sarah Cody. Now that our fake client has brought their fake device to the Jacobs Institute, the GoFARS 3000, how do we test its efficacy and compare it to other aspiration catheters? Here at the Jacobs Institute, we can use our anatomically relevant 3D models to test and compare different devices before they get clinical trials, and maybe one day in place of clinical trials. My name is Sarah Cody, and this summer I worked on simulating vessel collapse within these 3D models. Before we get to that, however, I think we should talk on about how 3D models are actually made. It all starts with a model designed using software. The top image shows a model that I created in a 3D digital space. Each different portion of this model was created using a different software, each of which have their own strengths, such as organic versus geometric geometries. Next, you have to assign materials to the different portions of the model. As you can see in this image, each different color represents a different material. So what this looks like in our models is a rubbery human-like vasculature made of a material called agilis and a rigid base made of what is called ferroclear. All right, so now you have your design, you have your materials, it's time to send it to the printer. So how the printer works is by laying down resin and curing it layer by layer, effectively building your model from the bottom up. Once off the printer, your model is covered in this thick support material both inside and out. Now this is important because it had a really large effect on the design changes that I made. So once you clean off this material, your model is ready to go. Okay, back to GoFARS 3000. We want to test this device on our 3D models, but there's a problem. The JI model success rate for aspirating a clot is around 100%. Whereas in real clinical scenarios, it's only around 80%. And I know what you're thinking. Isn't 100% always better? And I agree with you. My mom never took me out to dinner when I got 80s. But if we want our models to be able to accurately compare different devices and to mimic real human statistics, we need to alter the models since we can't alter the humans. So how do we do this? Well, by mimicking human phenomena. 
particularly vessel collapse. As you can kind of see from this video, vessel collapse occurs when you have a clot lodged within a vessel. Now, if you go to turn on suction and are too distal or far from the clot, the vessel may actually pinch, making it impossible to accelerate the catheter and potentially causing damage to the delicate vasculature. All right, so now with all these goals in mind, we began our iterative process of engineering. We started small by testing different wall thicknesses to see which, if any, would collapse in the presence of suction. However, considering that our vessels were so thin and delicate as is, we wanted to find the thickest wall that yielded our desired results. And from that came the tube model, which is exactly what it sounds like. A model that has eight tubes, each of varying wall thicknesses. And as you can see, we did get vessel collapse within this model. Note the kind of pinching of the vessel. That's when the catheter is turned on. Okay, so now we have a designated wall thickness. Our next step was to apply it to organic human geometries to see if that would have any effect. The model we chose was the intracranial model, which literally means inside the skull. As you can kind of see from the pictures, the model started at your carotid arteries, which are like here, and went up to the vessels that surround your brain. This model generated near perfect results. So if you look at this video, we have collapse in the M1 region, which is just the first branch off of the circle of Willis. On one side of the M1 bifurcation right there, we have a clot, which I promise is there, even though you can't see it. And on the other, we have a clamp. So now that we've tested this model, there were some issues to be addressed. First, because of the fragility of those vessels, we did have a small leak early on. Also, Collapse only occurred in ideal scenarios. So these are things like a catheter that was roughly the same diameter as the vessel and complete flow arrest, which basically means that there was little to no flow past the point of that clot. We can't always replicate these ideal scenarios. So we decided that our solution would be to make it more replicable, un replicable under more conditions, as is often the case in scientific experiments. My next round of iterations had the following objectives easier, more consistent clot placement and flow rest without the help of a clamp, and be easier to clean after printing without risk of damaging those delicate vessels. I also wanted to change the inflow and outflow tubing connections so that they provided a more secure fit. So for our first goal of achieving consistent clot placement that would cork flow, let's talk about how and where we were placing clots. As is often the case in clinical scenarios, clots tend to become lodged within the M1 and M2 bifurcations. However, we had trouble lodging clots here. This is because we lodge our clots by running them in flow through the model until they get stuck and then kind of pinching them towards where we want them to be. Now, one thing you'll notice is that those vessels leading directly to the bifurcations are quite a bit thinner than the bifurcations themselves. So by the time the clots reached that point in the model, they were all small and misshapen and could not secure themselves there. And remember, if clots aren't secured in these regions, they'll be easily aspirated and we wouldn't see any collapse. So I theorized that creating what I called clot landing zones would give a spot to more consistently land clots within these bifurcations. I came up with two models. The first was a pinch, which is like an hourglass shape, and the second was a saddle, which would allow the clot to sit between two smaller pinches. These are placed at three different locations in the model, each of which is colored. And note that they're at those bifurcations that we just spoke about. As for improving post-processing, I went ahead and thickened up any vessel walls that weren't being directly tested for vessel collapse. So this was mostly past the M3 region. I also added extra wall thickness to any areas that were particularly weak. These are things like bifurcations or tight turns, just anywhere that looked like it needed extra support. Finally, the smooth tubing connections were changed for a barbed tubing connection to allow for a little more secure fit when the tubes were attached. So I went ahead, printed, processed this model, and remember how Sarah said to stay flexible? That is especially true when you're trying out new models in engineering. After weeks of hard work, during post-processing, the model ended up breaking right there. So I theorized that this was due to those really thin vessels not being able to support the thickened vessels. And it was back to the drawing board. All changes remain the same except for the thickening of those vessels past the M3 region. All right. Finally, I was really able to print, process, and test my newest model, and it was a success. With those clot landing zones, we achieved more consistent clot placement and flow arrest. 
weak areas were reinforced appropriately so that we had no leakages or anything until we pushed the model far past its standard uses. And we saw collapse even when no clots were present but suction was on, which gave us some interesting physician insight about how even if you did aspirate a clot and if you were to leave the suction on for a little bit too long, you may still be risking that vessel collapse, which could damage the vasculature. All right, so now that we have vessel collapse in our models, we can better compare GOFARS 3000 to other aspiration catheters. However, human anatomy is so variable, it would be kind of silly to assume that this model was the end all be all for testing. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Angelique. Hello, my name is Angelique, and I was also an engineering intern at the JI this summer. Now, the GoFarce, GoFarce 3000 can be accurately tested with the help of Sarah's hard work of modeling vessel collapse. We then continue model development with my project. From what Sarah mentioned, 3D printing consists of printing material layer by layer, making one continuous model. I will be going into the development of Mondra models, meaning discontinuous, utilizing vessel connectors. You may be thinking if the current continuous models of the JI have been effectively working for our clients, why did I focus on modular models this summer? Keep that thought and let's look at some different anatomy that we're gonna replicate in our models. Here we have a healthy model. And just to note, everything above the line is intracranial anatomy and everything below the line is your arch anatomy which leads to your heart. Now, we have a disease model. Disease due to a bad diet, a bad lifestyle, or both. And putting these models side by side, you can definitely note the major differences between the two. The healthy model has straighter vessels, while the disease model has more torturous vessels. Torturous meaning twistiness, and some twisty vessels can be denoted by this circular outline. And this twisty environment creates a more challenging setting for GoFAR 2000 to navigate compared to the healthy model. Now Sarah also mentioned how it's a long, long process and how to actually process all of these models and actually make one continuous model. What if I told you that I can make these two models into four models instead? And this is where modular models come into play. And I want to stress their importance. With modular models, multiple anatomies can be mixed and matched at a time. With these two models, we can print the two separate intracranial anatomies from each other and actually plug and play them with each other and create four models instead. From this, GoFARS 2000 can be readily tested under various settings ranging from easy to challenging and we can actually accelerate medical device testing. Previously, I referred to the plug and play aspect of modular models. Well, we do need a way to actually plug or connect these models. And that's the area that I focused on this summer in the development of a vessel connector. My overall goal was to develop a watertight, low profile, easy assembly connections that could be integrated into 3D printed models. And now, I know I threw a lot of words at you, but just keep three keywords in mind, being watertight, low profile, and easy assembly. My project itself had to deal with vessel, vessel connector development, which in respect to two designs, one that we currently use and one that I spent the most time with. And another aspect of my project had to do with the human factor side of industry where I want to see if the robustness of the vessel connector can be put up to the test of, with any person of any level of experience. So let's first take a look at our current design, which is called the barb vessel connector. And with the barb vessel connector, we have two barb connections, one flexible and one rigid, a hose clamp, and that combines to the resulting assembly as seen. This design is watertight, it is low profile, but can we say it's easily assembled? Well, no, and that could be traced back to its multi-part assembly and the use of a host clamp. Which is why I further explored another design called the Pusher Connect. And it's titled, and it's also used as, as it's titled, which is you push the push tab and connect the two pieces together, which make for an easily assemb assembly. 
And with this, you can see that there's multiple pictures on the screen, which goes to show my long process in the design development, which I like to call my iteration journey. And please bear with me as it's a long journey and that uh, there is two words that I want to note before starting it. One being that clearance means the gap between two connected pieces and that an O-ring is a ring made of a flexible material used as a seal against leaks. So with iteration one, I used a clearance of 0.5 millimeters and a 3D printed O-ring made of an agilis. The 3D printed O-ring had some printing inconsistencies which caused tears to appear. This, alongside the loose clearance, resulted in the design being not watertight, which leads to my second iteration, which includes a tattered clearance, as well as now a standard external O-ring. Now, with both of these, the design was now watertight. However, I still wanted the low profile quality in order to make the most robust vessel connector, which leads to a third iteration, and it all looks kind of sad, but like this is like, I reduced the size by half, and as you can see, it was much smaller than I anticipated, and the fragility of the small size caused the push tab to crack under pressure, as well as the agilis vessel to separate from its very clear end. Now with the first iteration, I increased the size by a fourth, and this caused the design to be more sturdy, yet still low profile. And now I achieved the low profile quality, yet now I still haven't achieved the watertight quality as before. And that's because the standard O-ring did not fit as snug to the connector as I'd like it to. And I realized that this might be an issue for future designs as well. So then I looked back to the first iteration and thought maybe I can just use a 3D printed O-ring, but just change the material instead, which I did. And as Sarah mentioned, there are two materials that we do use often, which is Agilis and very clear. And the word in the parentheses is another material called Flex 50. The last two numbers of the word is a measure of hardness, and in this case, it's 50. Another example is a Flex 99, which is just as solid and hard as Veraclear, and 30 is associated with Agilis, which is our soft vessel material. Now with this, I have my fifth iteration. I wanted this material change because I wanted the flexibility of Agilis, yet I want the tear resistance of Veraclear. Iteration five is still yet to be finally processed, um, so I cannot speak on its qualities yet, but I strongly believe that this does check off all the boxes finally. So with this slide, it shows the iteration summary of my journey, comparing the first iteration and the latest iteration. It just really echoes the fact of the iterative nature of engineering and how often your final iteration can look like your first one out of just, you know, some, <laughs> out of some, some fate and like you just really go through a lot of changes to go through this. And now that I developed the vessel connector as much as I could, I wanted to do some human factors testing and now this is why I made a simplified model. A simplified model comparing design one against design two to, to ensure that design two was more easily assembled. However, just as both Sarah said, you do have to stay flexible. And during printing, the connections between the pieces did fuse, so this model is not viable to test with. Yet, I did continue to stay flexible and decided that I still wanted to do testing, but just with the two separate connector pieces instead. Which is why we go to this slide. And I wanted the help of people that range from novice level to intermediate levels of experience. So I enlisted the help of my fellow six interns and I tested the time it took to disconnect and connect each model, as well as their, each intern's experience with the model, scaling from a scale of one to five, where one is being relatively easy and five is being relatively difficult. And as seen, design two be design one in all categories and can be concluded as the more easily assembled model. Now let's backtrack to the aforementioned anatomical designs and integrate our robust vessel, vessel connector within them now this is where I leave off my project and future aspirations to actually integrate them in full-size models. Sarah's project in mind strives to advance model development, but benchtop testing doesn't just involve 3D models. Benchtop testing is not physiologically relevant without flow, and the flow of the system is going to be simulated through Ruby's work.
Hello, I'm Ruby, and I developed a flow pump for my project here at the GAI this summer. In order to perform research on different models here at the JI, a flow pump is necessary to pump and mimic blood-like solution through each model. In order to design this flow pump, I started with three steps. The first one is creating a DRTM, which I will talk about in the following slide. The second one is programming the pump to establish different waveforms and be able to alternate between frequencies and amplitudes. And the third step is creating a pump enclosure design with aesthetically easy, useful design to use and for the design to accommodate wiring and assembly. Phase one of the DRTM is just establishing the different user needs and what general yet specific design inputs are needed to fulfill those needs. Now, currently the JI already has a heavy flow pump but since it's so heavy weight, it's hard to uh, take outside of Buffalo when the models need to be transported. So the first step of designing this pump is just creating the code, which I start by creating waveforms, which are a signals graph over time. So the first, uh, the first waveform I worked on is the sine wave in the top right corner. Um, in order to understand basically how waveforms work, we can compare it to different examples. Uh, for example, a flashing light bulb. The sine wave in the top right corner, as the bulb flashes from the highest point and fades to the lowest brightness, you can see the highest amplitude and imagine the bulb fading with the wave until, until the lowest amplitude. As another example, you can look at the square wave on the bottom and picture an alarm clock beeping for two seconds and turning off for two seconds. When the alarm clock beeps for two seconds, the amplitude is at its highest. When it turns off, it's at its lowest. The next step is being able to adjust the frequency and amplitude of each wave. With the frequency photo in the top, you can see that if you raise the frequency of a signal, then the distance between each of the peaks shortens. If we use the light example, the flashing light example, then we can imagine if we raise the frequency, the flashing of the bulb also speeds up. When we think of amplitude, we can see that if we lower the amplitude, the peaks also lower. If we think of the light example in this moment, then we can know that if the amplitude lowers, then the dimness of the bulb also lowers. We need this because frequency and amplitude determines the speed and pressure of the water flowing through each of the models. The last step was to convert an analog to a PWM signal. First, we need to, in order to understand this, know that this sine wave signal at the top is the exact same signal we've seen on the previous two sides, so there's nothing different. To better understand how it works, we have to know that both of these graphs are the exact same graph they just produce, they're two different languages that produce the exact same output. Now, the reason why PWM signal is different from a regular analog signal is that discrete, it is cut into discrete chunks that look like little boxes, and the higher the brightness of the bulb, the wider the boxes are, and vice versa. So what is the point of this step? Well, we have to do the step to allow the pump to interpret the signal that we designed in the code. To better understand it, here's some live waveforms that I took. Um, the one on the left is a sine waveform. This is the one where the flashing light occurs. You can see that while the light uh, gets brighter, the boxes get wider and vice versa. On the second one, you can see the square waveform where we can look at the, think of the alarm clock example where when the alarm clock beeps, there are squares. When the alarm clock turns off, there are none. The final step of this project was creating the enclosure to hold all of these parts. And I started with just designing a simple box on a software and then adding extrusions, which are parts that raise off of the box in order to secure the circuit parts within. So the different circuit parts are shown up here. 
The motor driver module converts voltage, the potentiometer changes the amplitude and the frequency of the signal, and the breadboard is used along with the Arduino board in order to follow out what the code tells it to do. Finally, I was able to 3D print the box. So the first print is shown above, but as both Sears and Angelique have mentioned, flexibility is needed for products such as FAR 3000, FARS 3000. So I had to readjust the design because parts just wouldn't fit. So after I redesigned it, you can see on the right, the two new boxes, one with and one without the parts that I designed on the software, and the final box is printed below. So to see everything I said put in action, here's the final working box. The, the pump, the box is out of the frame controlling the frequency, waveforms, and amplitude. The purpose of making this pump is not only portability and aesthetics, but to have a JI made pump that can be included with models when they are sold. So what now? After all three of us engineers have spoken, you can now better understand the process of developing a draft design, such as GoFARS 3000, and what has to occur before taking the next steps of the medical device development process that Ryan will go on to explain. Thank you. So now that our device has been tested using the physiological models created by our engineers, we're almost ready to compile all the data that's necessary for an FDA submission, which is what ultimately get our device into clinical practice. But this device is by no means perfect, as there is potential for a lot to go wrong. There are many potential risks to both our user and our patients using something as invasive as an aspiration catheter. This may not be the first version of this device, and other companies may have made similar devices with poor outcomes. It all begs questions like, how can we mitigate risk and increase patient safety? How do we make our device flexible enough in order to account for human error that's bound to occur? Or put even more simply, how do we make our device the best version of itself? This is where the Office of Quality Services comes in. Hi, my name is Ryan O'Donnell, and I was the intern in the Office of Quality Services this summer. So my background in quality starts last summer when I did research with UB Anesthesiology um, over at OSHAI, uh, determining uh, patient satisfaction and provider satisfaction during PACU handoffs. Um, but I didn't really know how quality fit into the inner workings of a medical device company. But after spending eight weeks on the quality team and also receiving my basic certification in quality improvement and patient safety from the IHI, I'm fully prepared to tell you how quality and why it's so important in the world of medical devices. So the OQS is probably the newest and most upcoming part of not only within the JI, but also within the world of medical devices itself. This whole idea of providing quality care to patients while also taking measures in order to increase satisfaction and safety protocols has only been around for about half a century, originating in Japan after World War II. And to do that, a company will implement what is known as a quality management system that has three components, quality improvement, quality control, and quality assurance. Quality improvement is hypothesizing and executing positive changes within the current system through what are known as PDSA cycles, which stand for plan, do, study, and then act. Quality control is then implementing strict policies and processes from those changes that are necessary for safety, and in our case, patient safety. And lastly, quality assurance is following compliance standards set by those policies with feedback loops in place in order to account for human error. Where these three things converge, is our QMS. Thanks to the International Standards of Organization, or ISO, we now have guidelines for any medical device company looking to implement their own QMS that are outlined in a document known as ISO 13485, or what I like to call the Bible for quality improvement. So what does this have to do with the JI? So my, the main goals of my projects this summer has been to not only help develop our own QMS within the JI, but also showcase to our external clients how we can do the same for them. What the OQS at the JI does is not only provide tools in order to develop a company's quality management system, but also provide inspectional and training services in order to increase the likelihood that their device will be approved by the FDA, which have pretty strict standards. 
We bridge the gap between research and design, or R&D, and regulatory services as we oversee both benchtop testing and clinical data collection in order to make sure that everything is in standard with the FDA. We do things with our R&D like take over documentation uh, and review and interpretation of results to make sure that uh, everything one expects is in place. This is why we have an equal number of engineers, physicians, and policy experts on our team. My first goal this summer or project has been to create this handout that you see on the right. It's meant to, ex uh, it's meant to advertise to our external clients all the services that the OQS would have to offer to them. And you can't see it because it's cut off at the bottom, unfortunately, but it includes the JI's quality policy that reads, the Jacobs Institute is focused on accelerating the research, design, development, and manufacture of innovative, high quality, clinically relevant engineering solutions and products to impact the treatment of vascular and related diseases. It's a bit of a mouthful, but very important nonetheless. So this graphic here on the left that I pulled from my handout on the previous slide kind of explains how a QMS fits into the inner workings of a medical device company. The FDA, uh, a company has to follow FDA ISO audit criteria in order to establish certification for their QMS, which will then allow them to conduct clinical practices and trials. However, to make sure that everything is constantly in compliance, a company will audit its own employees several times a year, known as an internal audit, while the FDA will also, will also audit the company as a whole, known as an external audit. I was in fact trained this summer on how to conduct an internal audit within the JI. So let's say that the company that created our GoFars 3000 device came to the JI not only to get its aspiration catheter implemented into clinical practice, but also to develop its own quality management system in order to, for future devices it might build. I'd like to highlight three of the services that the OQS would have to offer to them. QMS establishment and implementation, clinical quality training, and auditing and inspectional services. So the JI is providing the necessary tools to help its external clients build a conforming QMS through things like device and supplier management and developing what are known as good manufacturing practices, or GMPs. You can't have an effective QMS without GMPs. GMPs are product quality standards focused on the production and quality control of the product itself more so than the overall system and business practices. So this includes things like following written procedures, using and providing personal protective equipment, and demonstrating job competence, just to name a few. The JI also provides training to both its own employees and to external clients on the major components of a QMS and device improvement. Services like this include CAPAs, which stand for Corrective and Preventative Actions, and this is taking data from customer feedback on previous devices and data from our benchtop testing that results in non-conformities. We then propose solutions as to how to, to prevent these problems from happening in real time, known as corrective actions, or in the future, known as preventative actions. We also identify the causes of certain issues with our devices and propose solutions as to how to fix them, known as root cause analysis. My second project this summer focused on risk management documentation. I was tasked with creating automated Excel templates in order to replace the manual docu documents that we have currently at the JI that are subject to a lot of human error since you have to input all of the data manually. I provided an example here about a potential risk from our aspiration catheter to show you how the templates work. So let's say we have a sanitation problem. The catheter that's being inserted into our patient has somehow been contaminated, which puts both our user and patient at risk for a systemic pathogenic infection. That harm comes from a drop-down list that's linked to a harms library that I created that can be added to, changed, and categorized by our partnering physicians. This harm has a severity level of three that has been assigned to it that ranges on a scale of one to five. One being that it's negligible, and five being that it's catastrophic. And a probability of class C, ranging from A through E, A being that it happens all the time, and E being that it rarely happens. These two data inputs will output a risk level of medium, and that comes from risk management protocols set forth again by ISO. Now let's say we don't take any action in order to mitigate that risk. Our residual risk levels will stay the same, which of course is not acceptable. We want to mitigate, mitigate that risk or make it as low as possible. So if we take actions like wearing personal protective equipment or transporting our catheter using sealed packaging, now our residual risk level has dropped to a severity level of one, a probability of class E, which now outputs a low risk level. 
Lastly, we have to make sure that our device is ready for any sort of FDA inspection and that all our employees are complying with the ISO standards. For my third project, I worked on a clinical investigation plan that was for a certain revascularization device that a company wanted to implement into clinical practice. I was tasked with creating checklists set forth by the monitoring plan of the investigation manual for, to make sure that things like patient consent forms, eligibility for clinical trials, and electronic records were all being reviewed before actually conducting those clinical trials. Something maybe for our GoFAR 3000 device would be a similar case. Something like these checklists would have to be required by the FDA for safety standards, and would need to be available at any time during a company audit. The JI coaches its clients on what to expect during an FDA inspection, and provides mock audits and gives feedback on what they can do to improve. So now that our device has been tested, it's been evaluated for risk and safety, and it passes all of our compliance measures, we're finally ready to comply, compile our, all our data for an FDA submission and hopefully an approval, where I will give it over to Fiona. Okay, so GoFars 3000 has now been approved by the quality team. This means that the device is at the best it can be from an engineering and quality standpoint. But our prototype is still in the benchtop testing phase, so how are we to move the device out of the lab and to patients? This is where the Office of Regulatory Service plays a role. Hi, my name is Fiona and I interned in the Office of Regulatory Services this summer. Regulatory can be thought of as a middleman between the device company's research and development team and the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. Here at the Jacobs Institute, the ORS works to provide insight to help navigate a medical device through the steps of clinical trials, FDA submission and approval, and ultimately to treatment and patients. Now, all this talk about a medical device, but does anyone here actually know what classifies as a medical device? The answer is probably no, and that's okay, because this is often the first question posed to the ORS team by our device companies. Now, what is the FDA, and what does it have to do with a device like GoFars 3000? The answer is honestly everything. The FDA is responsible for protecting public health by ensuring the quality of medications, devices, biologics, and so much more. I bet you didn't know this, but 25 cents of every dollar that you spend is allocated to the FDA. Just a little fun fact to help you put into perspective how important the FDA is in our everyday lives. Now, to narrow the scope for today's presentation, the JI focuses on neurological and vascular devices used to treat stroke, aneurysms, and heart disease. In my presentation today, I will be briefly outlining the three projects I worked on this summer and how they play a part in a regulatory process that's involved with bringing a device like GoFars 3000 to market. So we have our prototype. And the first step is gathering preliminary data in the form of in vivo testing. Now this is where the second question is brought to the ORS team. How to select the right type of study design, methods, and protocols to gather the most adequate data for the FDA. Unique to the JI, our in vivo testing can occur right upstairs in UB's Clinical and Translational Research Center. And as Ryan mentioned during his presentation, a device like an aspiration catheter poses significant risk to patients, and therefore an investigational device exemption submission must go to the FDA first. This can be thought of as a super formal lab report, proving that our device is both safe and effective, and is basically asking the FDA per for permission to be used in human clinical trials. One of the projects I worked on this summer was an IDE submission for a company attempting to bring a neurological device to market. I worked to create 15 different case report forms specific to the study protocol that helps track and monitor clinical data during procedure visits. Now that we have that squared away, an IDE takes about 30 days for approval. But for today's presentation, let's fast forward and pretend we have the green light to go into human clinical trials. Again, the same question is brought to the regulatory team. How to select the right study design, methods, and protocols to ensure we gather the best data for FDA submission? This is where a regulatory landscape comes in handy. 
A regulatory landscape is a database of medical devices with their supporting clinical data that can be used as a baseline comparison for new devices with the same exact indication for use. This summer, one of my projects was to create a regulatory landscape for neurothrombectomy devices with the indication for revascularization following an acute ischemic stroke. I first researched all of the previously approved FDA devices along with the clinical data that was used to support their submissions. And I pulled metrics like safety and efficacy outcomes, adverse events, mortality rates, and other study-specific metrics, and put this all into one giant Excel sheet. And to save you all from awkwardly squinting at me for the next 30 seconds, I left this out of my presentation today. However, you get to see one of my pretty graphs. Behind me, you'll see a primary outcome of previously approved mechanical thrombectomy devices. And on the far right-hand side of my screen, you'll see that the GoFARS device went through the hypothetical Intern 7 trial downstairs in the cath lab, and over 80% of patients had a successful reperfusion rate. Having a visual aid like this helps the ORS team to quickly compare our device to other approved devices to ensure that it's meeting FDA baseline standards as well as outperforming our predicate. So now we have all of our clinical trial data. What's next? Now we move to pre-market submission. This is where a fourth question is brought to the ORS team. How to know what of the six types of pre-market submissions should I pick for my device? In the case of GoFARS, we have a predicate device, and so therefore we will submit for a 510K, which can be thought of as a shortcut submission, where we only need to prove that our device is as effective as our predicate. This differs from, let's say, a de novo request, and this is from starting from the ground zero with a brand new device and a brand new indication for use. However, the FDA is a pretty big deal, so most clients often first choose to submit what's known as a 510K pre-submission. This is a rough draft, almost like when you submit an essay to a teacher asking for comments and feedback so you're able to revise before you submit for your final grade. Another one of the projects I worked on this summer was a 510K pre-submission for a company attempting to bring a device used to treat cerebral aneurysms to market. I worked to write the cover letter, device description, as well as organize all the clinical trial data and, com and co create clinical comparisons between the device and its predicate. Now, much like the other interns mentioned today, this aspect of flexibility, this is where it comes into play in the regulatory process. The cycle between submission, feedback, revisions, resubmission, this can go on for quite some time. But at the ORS, we work to decrease this time and bring your device to market faster. However, we are tasked with managing the expectations for both the client and the FDA to ensure that the most safe devices are brought to market. After our 510K has been approved, the device can now be used in patients. So today you've heard me speak about how the ORS supports device companies coming into Buffalo. But what is the ORS doing for the Buffalo community? The answer is through continuous learning. I drafted a website for UB's Clinical and Translational Research Center that outlines key FDA regulatory resources in the realm of medical devices, IDE, and clinical trials in order to promote further device development and increase accessibility to the FDA's information. A super cool aspect of my internship this summer was that I got to see how all the different aspects of the regulatory landscape plays into the different parts of this building. The device first came into the I2R lab that Emily mentioned earlier, went upstairs to UB's CTRC for in vivo testing and analysis, came back down to the JI for further regulatory consultation, went out and back between the FDA however many times it took for us to get that, that approval, and eventually, once we're approved to use in patients, it goes downstairs into the Gates Vascular Institute where we can now use the device in human clinical trials and patient treatment. The most important aspect of the innovation ecosystem here is that all of this device knowledge is coming back to Buffalo to benefit the community. And to hear a little bit more about what the JI does for the Buffalo community, please welcome Sylvia. Hello everyone, my name is Sylvia Hujek and I was the other education intern this summer at the Jacobs Institute, along with Sarah Wack, who spoke at the beginning of this presentation. 
So far today, you have learned how a hypothetical device such as the GoFars 3000 would move through the Jacobs Institute and out and get FDA approval. You have heard from our engineering interns who made a model to test the device on, connectors to be able to interchange different parts of the model, and created a flow pump that mimics the flow of human blood in these models. You've also heard from our quality and regulatory interns who analyzed the risk in using a device such as the GoFars 3000 and compared it to its device's competitors in order to help in the submission to get FDA approval. All of these steps have a vital process in bringing a medical device from its final design stages to out and into the public. So you may be wondering, what's next? Or in other words, what's the point in all of this? Why are we up here and why are you listening? The answer is that it all comes back to the community. People get jobs in healthcare, they become doctors, nurses, physical therapists, scrub techs, all because they want to help people in any way that they can. Yes, there are many different factors that, that evaluate how, what kind of career you want to go into, but it all comes back to one commonality. We want to help the community. And with vascular disease rates in Western New York being some of the highest in the entire country, this is why the Jacobs Institute is here. This is why our engineers and doctors are working here. Yes, we want to help the community, but more importantly, we want to help the Buffalo community. However, there is a fundamental gap between medical innovation centers such as this one and the community. We can innovate all we want here and come up with amazing ideas, but it doesn't mean anything if people don't know about it or can't get access to it. So how do we bridge this gap? How do we bring what we are innovating here out and into the community and bring people here to get involved? The answer is through education. Through education, we can first enroll participants in clinical trials. If people know about the devices we are innovating here and helping th move through and get FDA approval and they have conditions that could qualify them, we could get them to enroll in the clinical trials for these devices. This would ultimately help speed the process along in getting FDA approval and get these devices out and into the public and save more lives. Second, we can prevent vascular disease. The first step in combating an issue is to tackle it at its source. Here, we are only coming up with, with ways to treat vascular disease. Uh, and even with all the medical advancements, vascular disease is still one of the leading causes of death in America. So instead of just treating vascular disease, we need to be able to prevent it in the first place. Stop the diseases at their very first steps. And we can do this through education. We can tell people about these diseases, like heart attack and stroke, and let them know what they can do to prevent it, what they can do to help themselves and their loved ones. And finally, we can set up future engineers, doctors, and researchers for success. Our entire workforce will be replaced by the future generation one day. So what kind of legacy are we leaving for our children? It's great that we're doing what we're doing here, but we need to set up future generations for success. That means helping them to achieve more than what we can today. We need to provide opportunities to educate the youth and help them feel inspired and motivated to take over our projects and innovate for themselves. The Jacobs Institute itself has many educational programs whose purpose is to bridge the gap between here and the Buffalo community. These include the high school internship, the webinars, brain boot camps, and the college internship. The first three are what Sarah Wack and I worked on this summer. Our project was to help organize and oversee the high school internship and a webinar, as well as create a new lesson plan to use at our brain boot camps. The high school internship is a two-week summer program for rising junior and senior high school students, primarily from the Buffalo community, where we provide opp the opportunity to learn about different careers in healthcare and learn about vascular disease and endovascular surgery. When selecting applicants, we prioritize those coming from public schools around the area, those who normally would not be given an opportunity such as this one. This year, the, in, the students were able to hear lectures from doctors, nurses, perfusionists, and physical therapists. They also took tours of the different facilities here in the Gates Vascular Institute building and the Jacobs School of Medicine. They also were, were given the opportunity to shadow downstairs in the cath labs and perform here in the Jacobs Institute on an endovascular surgical simulator. Additionally, they were tasked with the assignment of researching on a topic of their choosing and on the last day of the presentation of the internship they presented on this topic. Sarah and I helped organize and execute this entire internship and the feedback we received from both students and their parents has been extremely heartwarming. One student in particular said, this is probably the best thing I've done so far and I'm so, so glad for the opportunity. 
because I was on cloud nine for those two weeks. So I'd just like to say thank you wholeheartedly. Overall, students reported feeling much more interested and motivated to pursue careers in STEM, which will definitely help set them up for success in their future academic endeavors. Next, Sarah and I also helped organize a webinar about heart health and wellness. We had two speakers for this webinar, Lisa Neff, the Senior Community Impact Director from the American Heart Association, and Dr. George Matthews, a cardiologist and the Chief of Service at Kaleida Health. Together, they educated the public about cardiovascular disease. They talk, talked about specific data related to Western New York and what they can do to prevent it. I also personally led a stretch break in between the two speaker, speakers to help promote heart healthy and stress relieving activities. We had about 25 participants log on to watch the webinar live, but we've also uploaded a recording of it to YouTube. So after this, you can go watch it for yourselves. Brain boot camps are half-day programs the Jacobs Institute provides for middle and high school students, clubs, and organizations in which they come here and learn about a variety of different topics related to the JI and vascular disease through different modules. This summer, I helped create a lesson plan, a new lesson plan to incorporate into these brain boot camps. I created a lesson plan that will explain to students what an aneurysm is. The curriculum for this lesson plan basically starts out with a breakdown of what exactly an aneurysm is, the different kinds of aneurysms that can occur within our arteries, and how they are treated. During this module, participants will also be placed in teams, and periodically throughout the lesson, there will be questions for them to answer, kind of like Jeopardy. Here's an example of one of the slides that will be presented during this lesson, which explains what exactly an aneurysm is. And here is one of the Jeopardy-like questions that will be asked periodically throughout the lesson. In case you were wondering, the answer to this question is 6.5 million. Each of these programs are designed to inspire, educate, and prepare students for the future. Education connects each phase of our lives, from kindergarten on to college and graduate school. It's what prepares students for their future and challenges them to innovate for themselves. Education is also what connects each of the interns' projects this summer. Utilizing our backgrounds and interests, each of our projects connect to show you how the Jacobs Institute would, would, would move a device like the GoFars 3000 from its final design stages out onto FDA approval and out into the community. More importantly, the Jacobs Institute emphasizes continuous le learning, meaning that the education doesn't stop once you finally get a degree. So upon getting FDA approval for this GoFars 3000, we are able to also bring in doctors through our training programs to help and practice on this device before utilizing it in patients. So coming back to the big question, why? Why are we here? What is the point? Well, it's the mission of the JI. This college internship is one of the educational programs that I mentioned earlier. This internship has set each of us up for success in our future. Our projects challenge each and every one of us. We tried. We failed. We tried some more, and then we failed some more. We learned from those failures, and then most importantly, we adapted and did not give up. In short, we were flexible. And we couldn't have done it without our mentors. Each of the interns were assigned to a mentor to help guide them along the way, provide feedback, and help them succeed in their projects. Each of them have played a vital role in this internship, so we just wanted to say thank you. With the help from our mentors and this internship as a whole, we will go far. Thank you. <laughs>
right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I guess like this was a side of medicine. Like I'm pre-med, I want to apply to med school next cycle. Um, this is a side of medicine like I never really experienced before, specifically in my department in quality. Um, and also, it was kind of interesting to see how um, all of us kind of fit together towards the end. Like we all come from different backgrounds, we come from different schools, we come from different areas across the country. Um, and it was interesting to see how we could take all of our own previous experiences, not only just within medicine, but in general, um, to see how we could all like advance something as like a hypothetical medical device. I thought that was really invaluable. One of the most important things I learned, at least from like day one, it was like it's okay to fail and it's okay to mess up. Like for example, like the first, like one of the first like couple like. The first iteration had like a couple of them, which is good because I actually broke one of them and like I was like testing it out. And then like I was just like, oh no, I broke it. Like, what am I gonna do? Like, uh, and like I was like, I was like freaking out. But then like one of the, one of the current engineering interns, Connor, was just like, no, it's okay. You can break stuff. Like, it's fine. Like, and from the breaking, you can learn from it and you can keep fixing it. Like, it's okay to break stuff. It's okay to mess up and fail as long as you learn from it and then move on. Yeah, so I actually have a background in history, so a lot of this was very new to me, um, but I really enjoyed everything I did. Working with the high school interns was especially amazing for me, because like, I also got a lot of those guest speakers too. Like, I hope they enjoyed it, but I loved it. Um, we also got to go on tours. Um, I got to hold a human brain at one point. Like, that's something I never thought I'd do, and now I'm a changed person because of it. But it was just, I got, <laughs> really, life is mundane now. But. It really was just a great experience because this is something I never thought I would do. I never was interested in science in high school, and now I'm like, why wasn't I? This is amazing. So it was just kind of stepping out of my usual comfort zone, but in a really great way. So some of the things that I found interesting were also mentioned previously. So to come up with something new, um, I think the biggest takeaway is to not compare yourself to other people, that your path is not going to look like someone else's path. No one has that cookie cutter journey in life. And I know when, I, when the interns were first announced for this summer, I was so intimidated by these guys. Like they've accomplished so much in life. Reading their bios, I'm sure you've read it in their programs. Everyone's accomplished so much. And I felt like I was the complete outsider. I was like, oh my Oh my gosh, these people are crazy. But then we all had a conversation at lunch and we all felt the exact same way, which felt which means that, you know, if you're feeling, you know, like an imposter imposter syndrome is kind of a big thing, other people are probably feeling the exact same way. And so try not to compare yourself because your journey's not going to look like everyone else's. Before we move on, I just want to say I don't know why Silver is intimidated. He's literally a national like <laughs> ice skating champion from Slovakia. Like I don't know why she's intimidated by us. But like <laughs> everyone feels it. Um, okay, my biggest takeaway. Well, first off, friends. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad we all met each other. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea that like there's no such thing as time wasted. So I. When I was trying to make some of those design changes, I wasn't super familiar with the software. And I ended up spending like two days trying to accomplish something that had to be completely written over. And it kind of felt like I spent all that time in vain, but it wasn't. I learned more about like software, I learned more about like what I could do with it. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Just that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Feels like a waste of time, it's not. <laughs> Um, I would say my biggest takeaway, I usually work in the engineering side, don't really get out much because of it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, um, I do so much engineering work that I don't really know, like, I had no idea what quality or regulatory did. I also don't know, like, the FDA's involvement at all. That was so crazy to learn about. There's so much here that I just got to step out of the engineering comfort zone with, so that is definitely what I'm grateful for. I would say that I've never been in an internship where I've worked besides six like extremely smart people that if I was struggling and my mentor wasn't available or like I didn't have anyone to go with, I could always bounce ideas off the six of them and I would always get a great new idea that I hadn't thought of and that's kind of like a huge part of the JI is that collaboration and I found that I got that from the six of them as well as JI staff who are always super helpful and like really happy to help. Um, also, to like, eat your chicken wings in moderation because I had no idea that there was so much disease in Buffalo. And, I, and, I, and I'm from Buffalo, like I grew up here and I had no idea, so that's another big one. <laughs>
So along the lines of failure, um, just interested, did anyone find out anything that they don't want to do further on in life? So a big part of internships, right, is it's good to find what you like, all the cool stuff, but did, did anyone come across anything that they're like, you know what, I don't want to do that the rest of my life? There's still a lot of value in that piece of that from an internship pers uh, perspective. Hi. Oh, you want to start? Yeah. Oh, sorry, aspect. I have had previous experiences with clinical trials, and I love learning and reading, analyzing all of that. And going forward in my career, I want to be involved in clinical trials, but from this internship, I'm now like 100% certain I want to be on the side of a provider. Like I want to be a medical provider issuing that care rather than being on the regulatory side of like an, an analysis of that. So I kind of like yes and no, I love clinical trials. This internship helped me expose that as well as learning so much more about upcoming devices that I had no idea before. But I do think going forward, I would like to be on the side of a medical provider rather than a regulatory personnel. I don't really think this internship really like cut off anything for me, like to cut off what exactly I want to do. I think it more kind of improved the different options I have in engineering and the different pathways I can go. So it was more kind of just like giving me more opportunities and ways to look so that I know that I'm not kind of confined to my own space. Um, I think similar to Ruby, it's not so much that there was something I didn't like or wouldn't want to do in the future, but I do realize that I want to have a little more like patient interaction, if you will. So I saw a lot of like patient's anatomy, but not the actual person attached to them. So I would like to have a little bit more of that um, interaction. Hmm. So I think for me, I've always been very, very set on what I want to do, and that's become a doctor. Um, from early stages in my life, both of my parents are doctors, um, that's just what I've been um, exposed to, and that's ultimately what I want to do. So if anything, this internship really enforced that too, because I got to work on the education side of things. So I got to work primarily with the high schoolers the past two weeks, and that was a really fulfilling experience to see that something that you're helping organize, something that you put so much work into, thinking and processing, because a lot of work goes into scheduling a, 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 an internship, internship like this. I had no idea going into it, so, but so much work goes into it, and to see the feedback and how students were like genuinely changed by the experience, that was so fulfilling with me, for, fulfilling for me, and that's something I want to do for the rest of my life. Yeah, so kind of building off of what Sylvia just said, um, I kind of always knew I wanted to work with students, but that was just reinforced here. So there was, a, you know, the period before we had the students and the period we, after we had the students, and having the students was like the highlight of everything. After they were gone, I came in Monday and I was like, what is the point now? Like, where are my students? Um, so it helped me just kind of like reinforce the fact that I want to work with students and be in a, like, in a position where I can work with students day in, day out, help them figure out like what they want to do, because I love seeing that passion and I love being able to help students in any way I can. So it was really just reinforced with this internship. So originally when I applied for this internship, I like applied for like the engineering intern and also applied for the quality intern, but I was like preferably the engineering intern, but like I was very curious about quality and what had to like, in, like what like a quality engineer had to like entail. And like the good thing about the JI is like you get to like work in a little bit of all or like learn all about the different departments within the, within the JI. And like as I got to learn more about Ryan's quality internship and also more about the quality department, like not no offense to like Laura, Mike, or like Jess, but like I don't think I want to work in quality. Like no, like no offense to them. Like great work. Like we need quality. But like I don't think personally I want to like work in there. So for me, it just reinforced the fact that like I would want to work on more of like more the hands-on side of things, less and less on the more of like the more quality and like review of other designs. Yeah, for me, so like going off that idea of hands-on, I'm definitely going nowhere near computer science just because like after seeing Ruby's, you'd be, and then like to make my Excel templates, you'd be surprised the hundreds of Excel tutorials I had to watch <laughs> in order to be able to code those things. So definitely want to be more hands-on, um, but obviously uh, that was like m a more minuscule part in the whole idea of quality that I learned about this summer. And like, I'm going to take all of those things that I learned and hopefully implement it into my future practice, which 
It's really important. No more questions. Adnan Siddiqui, I'm, I'm the CEO of the JI, and um, I just wanted to say uh, I have a question for Emily. Uh, so Emily really has been uh, responsible for putting together this uh, amazing internship opportunity for incredibly brilliant minds from around the country. She's been supported by Pam and um, by others, by Mike and others. But it's really been her brainchild. So she's off to New Jersey in in a, in a month and um, to play professional hockey and get ready for medical school. So I just wanted to thank her and I wanted everybody to uh, raise their hands and give her a round of applause <laughs> for a wonderful job. Thank you. And speaking of futures, I have one last question for all the interns. By the way, I hope you guys noticed that they are color coordinated their outfits with the timeline of Go Fars. <laughs> but where, if you would remain at the JI for a little bit longer, where do you think your projects would go next? So my uh, templates are being routed into the system right now, which is really exciting. So hopefully um, our uh, manual documents are going to be completely re replaced by that. Um, the handout that I made, the marketing handout, um, we don't have an OQS web page currently on our JI website. So in addition to that, I created a whole PowerPoint to create to our board of directors that like kind of goes into detail about all the services that we offer and what to put on that website specifically. So hopefully um, in the future, like. I'll be able to see a web page that I created. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. So hopefully, hoping to ex like get m more um, people to know about like what quality is, you know, because I don't think my, I myself and I don't think many of you actually knew like when I said quality services, like what did that actually mean? So yeah. So if I had to fix something or like what I'll do next would probably be um, to redo the simplified model and actually just print the two like halves by themselves and then connect them at the end so that can actually give like good like static um, testing results because the separate connector is like oh like the interns can like move them around but like when you have a large model they're usually static and then you actually have to like figure it out and actually like have a really enclosed space to work with so it actually just like redo the simplified model to make them more viable and also, if that like works out viable testing and like design two is more um, user friendly, as the same as all from before, then I would make like a vessel connector um, library of like different sizes, so that you could actually just have different uh, modular models, like not just like separating the intracranial and the arch anatomy, and like you can have them somewhere else in your body. Also, the matter of fact that all patients have different sizes, so. It's good to have a library of common sizes to work with when you do want to implement them within your designs. Yeah, I would like to see, if possible, like maybe the high school internship go a little bit longer. Two weeks just went by so quickly, and I feel like there's also so much more that could be done with the right planning and things like that. Um, I also, I think this has been talked about a little bit before, but I'd like to see like some sort of portable version of the educational opportunities the JI offers, like maybe that brain boot camp, because teachers have to jump through so many hoops to like get a field trip for their kids. But if we could bring it to them, I think of just how many more schools, how many more students that could be reached, and they could really learn a lot. Again, like I learned so much being here, like maybe reconsider like science as like a whole like career and stuff like that. So I would love to see this be able to reach more and more students as much as possible in some sort of portable fashion. Yeah, similar to Sarah, since I worked on the same projects as her, um, I think that the high school internship was something that was really, really great. That something that I would have loved to do in high school. And this year we only had 20 students. So 
having those 20 students, I thought about how many more students would have loved to be here and how many more students would be changed by this experience. So maybe expand it or be able to repeat it. So it's segments, you know, high school internship part one, high school internship part two, and it's new students cycling through. Um, additionally, I'd hope to see my aneurysm lesson plan incorporated <laughs> into the brain boot camps. I spent a lot of time on that, so that'd be really cool. <laughs> Um, shocker, just more iterations specifically. <laughs> so when we put in, so these are really thin vessels, so they already have a lot of resistance. When we put in those clot landing zones, they added even more resistance, which means that all the flow in the model was like redirected here and here. So my iterations would probably consist of trying to add in some sort of resistance to these to see if we could get the outflow to be a little bit closer to equal among all four branches. Mm -hmm. Um, for my product, I definitely think there's so much more to be done regarding aesthetics and programming. Um, but not just that, I would love to see the actual product go through quality and regulatory, because after learning so much about it, I realized how interesting it is getting the actual product onto the market. So I'd love to go through that process and get more of outside of engineering and that kind of ideology. The site that I showed at the end of my presentation was a draft to submit to UB, so that has not been approved yet. So I would like to see a, like that to be moving forward, meeting with them, discussing, honestly, like, giving a presentation, because for that I had to make a whole PowerPoint that went through each link that I submitted and kind of like the gist of all the links, that all had to be submitted in to UB. So I would like to go to a meeting with them and kind of sit down and talk them through that and hopefully to see that be published on their website. And also along with my regulatory landscape that I had showed, I also worked to analyze, and I'm not even exaggerating when I say 75 different published studies for brain computer interface to help with stroke rehab. So I mapped out all of the different indications, study types, results, and I kind of want to see how that moves forward. We were starting to look at the specific companies that were working with that, um, but I didn't really have time to dive into that fully, and I think that's a really cool upcoming field that kind of mixes technology and medicine together, so I would like to see the next steps in that project. Okay, one last round of applause for our intern. And thank you, audience, for being so attentive. Um, as a reward, we do have snacks, as promised, across the hall. Um, so please feel free to peruse as you wish. And thank you for coming.